wherever they go. go. Now, it's ironic that, of course, the news media, they're like so upset. They're destroying history. Yes, that's tragic. But what about the thousands of people they're beheading? What about the Christians? They're like, well, you know, they're suffering. Amen. <clears throat> In conclusion, I would argue that Daniel 2, this most foundational prophecy that brings light to so many other prophecies that helps us to understand what's unfolding in the earth right now, right in front of us. It helps us to understand loosely where we are on the time clock before the return of Jesus. Some of the things that need to still take place, but yet you can see how close we are. I would argue that the fourth kingdom is what I'm calling the historical Islamic caliphate, the historical Islamic empire. There were various caliphates but all together, they make up the Islamic Empire. It's just like the Roman Empire. You had the Julian dynasty or this dynasty, but we don't say they're different empires. We call it the Roman Empire. You have, you know, you have the Umayyad, the Abbasid, the, um, the ultimately the uh, Ottoman Empire, various empires. So basically, what Nebuchadnezzar saw was a series of empires that would crush his empire, that would rule over his, ultimately, which would be crushed by the coming of Jesus. So the head is Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece. The legs of iron speaks of the Islamic empire, the Islamic caliphate, which would be revived. It would be revived in the last days. It would come back to life. And then Jesus the Messiah, Yeshua the Messiah, comes from heaven and destroys that empire by the splendor of his coming and all of the others are destroyed at the same time. Now, if that's what Daniel 2 is saying, then when we get to all the other passages, they should all line up. And what I would argue, and, you know, again, I've peered into this diligently for so long, is that when you look at Islam as the key to the book of Daniel, everything falls into place. Everything makes sense. Suddenly, all these difficult passages fall into agreement when it's the Roman Empire, you got all these guys, the, the wizards of smart, and they go, well, in chapter 7, the little horn's the Antichrist, but in chapter 8, the little horn's somebody else. And they end up with all these, this, like, it just doesn't fit, it doesn't flow together. When you put Islam in as that which Daniel was speaking of, all of a sudden, everything lines up. So later, when you get to chapter 13, and you have the, the beast, the final beast, the final Antichrist empire... John says, the beast which I saw, it was like a leopard. Now, again, we're sort of tying into chapter 7. But the, the leopard is Greece, the Alexandrian Empire. It's not the modern nation of Greece. It's the Grecian Middle Eastern Empire. And his feet were la like of a bear, of the Medo-Persian Empire. And his mouth was a lion. Satan, the dragon, gave him power, his throne, and great authority. So we're looking for an empire which is a combination of what? Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece. It lines up perfectly with Daniel 2. Now, if you take Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece and combine them, does that look like the Roman Empire? No, it doesn't. So how do you make that fit? I debated a fellow a few weeks back on radio, and he said, well, you know, the Grecian Empire, they, they had um, a particular economy um, you know, and then they, uh, the Roman Empire, you know, combined democracy, and he's trying to take, like, concepts. It has nothing to do with geography. He tries to divorce it from any geography. And I'm going, that all sounds interesting, but where is that in the Scriptures? You're just making stuff up. I mean, I hate to say it, but literally, you're just grasping at straws to make stuff fit into this Eurocentric, Western-centric interpretation of the Scriptures. It doesn't work. Again, when we simply recognize that the context of the Scriptures revolves around Israel, we understand that Jesus is coming back, Yeshua, the King of the Jews. He said, he said are you the King of the Jews? He's like, yeah, I am. It is as you say. And he's coming back to reestablish the throne of David, the Jewish royal, royal monarchy, the Jewish royal dynasty. Amen? And we, those of us that are Gentiles, and I don't, you know, I don't, I'm as Gentile as you can get. 
I don't pretend to be Jewish. People always say, you know, are you Jewish? And um, you look Jewish. You must be Jewish. And um, I'm like, you know something? Actually, I come from a, a tr transracial family, and my son is, you know, I'm trying to be a dad to him to help him navigate through this world as a black man who's <laughs> going to be way bigger than me. Um, but uh, I'm like, you know, I know you think I'm Jewish, but, and I know I don't look it, but I'm actually black. I'm much more black than I am Jewish. You're supposed to laugh. Um, <laughs> Yeah, yeah, it does. I know, I don't make sense. I, like I said at the beginning, as long as it makes me laugh, that's all that matters. But uh, in terms of, you know, my, who I am, I don't try to be Jewish. I don't want to become Jewish. I don't need to go get some tongue swab to prove that I'm Jewish. I'm Gentile. But because I believe in Yeshua, I get to participate in the inheritance when he comes back and establishes this kingdom. And all the nations are going to stream up to Jerusalem and celebrate the feast. And we're going to go up. And as real as this moment is right now, as real as this moment is, we're here. We, I, you can, if you want, well, you'll probably get tackled. But you can run up and hug me and touch me. I'm here. You're here. We are seeing each other with our eyes. <laughs> the day will come when we will see Jesus with these eyes. They'll be glorified. Amen. I always use the analogy. It's when I was, I hated school. Oh, I hated it so bad. It was like prison. People were like, what do you want to do with your life? I was like, well, I mean, to be honest, I want to smoke weed. I mean, basically, that was like my aspirations. And uh, they're like, but you got to graduate from high school. And I'm like, ah. I was like, I'm sick of you, Dad, and your rules. I'm going to go join the army. <laughs> I love pothead logic. <laughs> but I hated school so bad. And I remember when I was a freshman, like when you're 14 and you're going four years, I graduated. That was like inconceivable. It was like forever. Someday I'll graduate. I'll get out of this prison. <laughs> it was, life was so hard. <laughs> and now here I am, 20. Five years ago, I graduated. The day is going to come. You know, we sit here and we talk about the return of Jesus and we can set, but it, it's so out there on the horizon when we look at the prophets and we say, this stuff really is lining up. It's intended to encourage us because the fact of the matter is the time is going to come when we're going to be looking back a thousand years at the return of Jesus. It is real. And not only that, but I love the passage in uh, Job where he says, kind of like with my eyes, in my flesh, even after my flesh is destroyed, in my flesh I will see my Redeemer, my Creator. It's in this body, guys. Now, it's going to be glorified. It's not going to be this one that gets old and, you know, gets sick and bad breath and just all the stuff, right? Where it's going to be a glorified body, but it's still in the body. We can smell the aroma of the burnt offerings flowing down from the temple in Jerusalem and the incense. So for the, for the meat eaters, we get to smell the barbecue. <laughs> and for the hippies, we get to smell the incense. <laughs> and we go up and we get to see Yeshua sitting on his throne of glory. And I don't know how it's going to work. Let me just close with this. The, uh, I, I began by talking about being balanced in our approach to biblical prophecy. And I think one of the main purposes of prophecy is to encourage us that our hope is real. Yes, it seems like it's forever on the horizon, but it's going to be here very soon. It really will be here. And if you, don't, if you die before then, it's, you'll close your eyes. I, I don't believe in soul sleep. I believe you'll be in heaven with him in spirit. But the time is coming when will be changed in the twinkling of an eye and we will be gathered together and we will be together. And it says, all the more as we reach this gathering together, don't forsake the gathering together, but encourage one another with these things, right? We are to encourage one another. But the other thing I want to just say is this and just wrap it up with this is that 
I see so many across the nations that are paying attention to biblical prophecy. And I, and I want to be clear. I believe there is wisdom in being prepared. Uh, I believe there is wisdom in, in being prepared for the storms ahead. But the purpose of biblical prophecy is to primarily not so that we build a bunker. The primary purpose of biblical prophecy is to spur us on so that we thrust ourselves into the battle fray, into the front lines, to give us an urgency so that we can snatch as many out of the fire before the day of judgment comes. It's to spur us on to give ourselves to that which we should be doing anyway. But as we see that day approaching, we would say, God, yes, I'm concerned with my family and my loved ones and, you know, all these things. And it's natural to have anxiety and fear and all those things. But um, we need to resist it, fear and anxiety. And, and the days ahead, the scarier they get, the more that we have to resist fear and, 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 and say, Lord, I, want, I don't want to die in my bunker with my rice and beans. I want to die on the front lines. And by the grace of God, I'll have an inheritance with me when I'm presented before you. Amen. Let's pray. Ah, oh, Abba, we thank you for your beauty. Yeshua, I love you. We love you. I love you, Yeshua, because 24 years ago, you saved me. You look down at this lost, depressed, just loser from South Shore, Massachusetts, who wasn't searching for you, and you opened my eyes. You revealed yourself to me, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And you brought me into this family. And you brought us into this family. And you haven't stopped loving us ever since. As the days become darker and more difficult, Yeshua, we ask that you would give us strength to imitate you and to walk in a manner worthy of our calling. And then even as we talked about that we could participate in snatching many of, uh, out of the fire, not by our own strength, but by your spirit, that we would just show up and say yes and allow you to do your work because we desire and we yearn to see the smile on your face and to see the smile on others' faces when they worship you. In that day, we long for that day, we yearn for that day, whether it's the most bloodthirsty Muslim in the earth or just the pothead next door. We ask that you would give us your heart for the lost, and we thank you for these things. In the name of Yeshua, your son, amen.